Hunger has plagued society throughout history. Despite efforts of scientists, political leaders, foundations, religious groups, nations, and the United Nations, even today, one billion people lack enough food and nutrition. Disease and death are commonplace. And throughout history, the curse of conflict, unrest, and war continues. As the author of several books, Dr. Robert Spitzer is one of the country's leading practical and practicing philosophers. After 28 years as a business leader, he joined the U.S. State Department to coordinate the billion-dollar Food for Peace program under President Ford and Henry Kissinger. Spitzer served as president of the Milwaukee School of Engineering for 14 years. He also serves as a board member and senior mentor of the world-renowned Kikaman Foods and is the founding chairman of the Norman Vincent Peale National Advisory Cabinet. Dr. Robert Spitzer presented the following message to the World Affairs Seminar at Wisconsin's Carroll University with cooperation from UW-Milwaukee and Rotary International. Over 300 students from 30 nations responded with a standing ovation. You know, the world is smaller now, and I remind myself of that with a, this little globe, because, see, all the flags that we wonderful have here in the, this big world of ours, you know, we could be any place in the world in a matter of hours today, and it's so much that we can learn one from another. And so I hope you good people from other nations love our country and know that we love the people in every country of the world. And so we, we welcome you. And your own knowledge of the newspapers tell you that the world population is increasing. Expected to be, well, it's over six billion today. It's expected to be uh, by 2050, 11 billion. So planet Earth. I remember, uh, you know, it's big, but I remember Jim Lovell. And Jim Lovell is from this part of the world too, a personal friend of mine. And uh, I said, what do you think about on that first moon mission? He said, Bob, one of the things I'll never forget, here we are with all this technology, and all this equipment, but I could put my thumb through our visible window there, and I could block out the earth with one thumb. And I guess in some ways we're pretty small. Now, there's a great group of historians, and I hope you make in your notes that in addition to other reading you do, you read history. This historian pointed out out of 3,400 years, only 268 have had peace. As we speak, it's not just the war in the Middle East. There are 20 conflicts going on around, around the world. Uh, 20. Some of you are from countries, God bless you, that where there is conflict and strife or civil war right now. Now, the other thing that we Americans need to appreciate better, that out of 100 world citizens, only five of us are from the US. So we're part of this global community. Now think about this a minute. This is a good Chinese proverb. A lot of us never get out of our hometown. We never get out of our county, our country. And a lot of us are that way with our minds too. A frog in the well knows nothing of the ocean. So that's why a function of this type is a real stretcher for your years ahead. Now, in the newspapers, they're filled with stories of war, they're filled with stories of, here, this Wall Street Journal, how to deal with a dictator. We're worried about North Korea. Stock markets, markets fall on growth fears. Um, Iran's web spine aided by Western technology. The best I can tell you from that is do read the papers, but be sure you get a balanced approach. I like some industry, like for me, agriculture is as much as education still important. So read. The person who reads nothing this year, it, it's just, you're bigger if 
by the people you've met and, and, and the reading that you do. So what I'm saying here is that there's lots of troubles out there, or apparent troubles, or are they symptoms? So you Americans, we've been blessed, and we have a little special responsibility. We've got to realize that only 50% of the world can read, and there's a lot of people that may know how to read, but they don't know how to balance a checkbook, or they don't know how to be to work on time. And so whether it's downtown Milwaukee, here at this beautiful Carroll College, uh, we can go to the store tomorrow, or we will on the way home and get some wonderful food. Uh, we, we, we spend only 10% of our take-home pay for, for groceries in America. More on that in a few minutes. But what is a greater gift than the land? And it's these gifts of freedom. The folks that came here several hundred years ago wanted to get away from tyranny and monarchies and suppression. And they had within them generators to, to advance and to worship as they chose to, to love God, to work, to raise a family, maybe buy a little bit of land, maybe buy a little bit of land. See, there's an ancient saying that says the footprint of the owner is the best fertilizer, the best food producer there is. So if you can own your own land, and that was one goal in my life, to help own some land just uh, rather than working for others. These freedoms are precious. Freedom of religion, freedom of education and opportunity, freedom to choose leaders, freedom to serve, and that's a moral obligation to help others. Now, should America fail, and I don't think we will, but should we, we wouldn't be the first society or culture ever to fail. You students of the history know that ancient Greece and ancient Rome and Babylon and other countries, in this case in Rome it was too much of the circuses and too much of the other things. And a small group of people started this a few hundred years ago. They were ordinary folks. They weren't high-powered people. They are folks like yourselves and your parents and your friends in your town. And to keep this thing going, this American experiments, we paid a big price, even killing ourselves. The Civil War, World War I, World War II, Iraq, <clears throat> Today, a lot of people have paid the ultimate price. Now, despite the headlines, generally, freedom and capitalism has won over communism. 20, yes, 20, 30, 40 years ago, I was really worried. The bear was expanding very, very, very fast over much of Europe and over parts of Asia. But we've been trying to stand up and generally, we have really, really established a mark that freedom and capitalism is so much better than, than communism. When I was in Russia, the Soviets were still in charge, the communists, and the government owned all the land. But they would give a farmer a couple of acres on here and there. And that, 5% of the land then was controlled by individuals. By, and that 5% produced more than 50% of the food produced in, in, all, uh, in all of Russia. Before the Soviets took over in Russia, Russia was an exporting country of wheat. But given the government domination and controls, it soon had to import wheat. This is one of those markets that I visited in Krasnodar many years ago, but those people would raise enough food for themselves and then would find a, a little to sell at, at the market. Strictly by coincidence, I had gone to an international conference in Seoul, Korea, and a group of Milwaukee Rotarians said, Bob, if you'll take us to if you take us to China after we finish 
uh, in Korea. We'd like to go with you. Uh, I said, I'm no expert on these things. Well, you know more about some of these things than we do. So uh, my wife and I took these 12 people, and it was a great experience. But what we didn't know is that's when the revolution was going to break out or the Beijing uh, incidents were to recur. We were there with two weeks before we ran into this thing full steam. <laughs> I had talked to some of my people in the State Department before we went in, and this man said, I would not recommend you going in there right now. Well, I took a vote of our 12 people, and uh, I was the only guy that uh, didn't want to go in. So we went in, and this is a couple hours before the killing, just a couple hours. Uh, we weren't supposed to be there, but a bus driver that was taking our little group around said, I'm going to take you there. He said, the world's not going to know this the, uh, unless some of you people see it. And so we did see that. That was Miss Liberty. That statue went down just hours or maybe even minutes after we were there. We were billeted in a hotel a couple blocks from there. I didn't see any killing, but I saw, uh, heard the gunshots and had reporters coming in. I remember one reporter came in and pleaded with the man at the desk, put these pictures in the vault because they may be part of history. The next day they finally were able to get a bus that would go through the carnage and the wrecks uh, in the city uh, to get to the airport, to get out. And there were some wonderful Filipino people that had been working at a hotel and we helped, helped to get them to the airport. When we got to the airport, somehow we got to Shanghai, but then by that time, the world was closing down, and we were stuck in the airport until a gutsy Northwestern crew decided to come in to get us. But these were people just like you that uh, were offered. They, they felt enough about freedom uh, to offer their lives. Uh, when we got to Shanghai, uh, there, it, was, it was going on much of China. Now, today's wars are on values and economics. Yes, shooting, but also values and economics. The day I was in Hong Kong, 250 ships came or left that harbor. So we live in an international economy. And remember, 50% of these people aren't literate. I'm with Father Franken in Sumatra. Any of you happen to be from the Indonesia part of the world? Well, it's a beautiful, big group of islands and country. And Father Franken had been there 14 years as a missionary. And we visited some villages where we were helping with food. And believe me, this is remote because the week we were four there, a tiger had in, in, invaded that, that village. And now we're going back to wherever I'm supposed to be going. And there's a log across the road. It's a roadblock, and these fellas came out of uh, out of the woods, and they meant business. Well, fortunately, Frank and Father Franken was there. They asked me for cigarettes. I said I don't smoke. Now, most of them are good. Now we're to South America, and there's a great potential here to help these people, and. Uh, my work was to take food through Food for Peace to try to help people who really needed it that day, but then my goal was to help them help themselves. Um, now, some of you will be able to see that, that little boy in the center, the yellow shirt has an extended stomach. Um, that, we can take care of that with protein and vitamin B1, but his mind is gone. Uh, if you have uh, poor nutrition, then, then you lose your mind, too. So you, hunger is basic to peace. Or to, we have to lick hunger. It's fundamental uh, to help people with the dignity. This is Bangladesh, huge population, country the size of the state of Wisconsin, but with huge, huge population. Now, we introduced a little free enterprise there. Time won't allow me to tell the story how the man I was going to see was murdered the day before I got there because he was for capitalism and for free enterprise. 
Uh, men will do anything if they, wanna, if they need to feed their family or if they need to feed their own stomach. So if we can help solve the hunger problem, we just may be the people that bring peace. Where there's hunger, there is no peace. There are a billion people hungry in the world, and if that's going to be the case, you're not going to really have the peace that we want. Now, some of your teachers are going to be critical of, quote, big agriculture. They better read a little more. We need little agriculture, but we also need big agriculture. We would be starving if it would not be for machines and, and uh, modern agriculture. My son was started out as a tenant farmer, and then he ultimately grew to 500 cows. He's not a bad guy because he's successful. He's a wonderful farmer. He's a wonderful citizen. He's a wonderful world person. Half of the food in the world is still produced by hand. No ox power, no water buffalo power, no horse power, just by hand. And this, incidentally, is from Indonesia and, uh, because I was impressed. They said, oh, we'll get you a new hoe, Dr. Spitzer. I said, I don't want a new hoe. I want the one that's, that's, that's working out there. So the world that you're coming into, young people, is a larger population, increasing food demand. Today's farmers, like my son, feed 100, well, it's actually closer to 150 now. But in many of these countries, as some of you know, a little food for themselves and for a few others. But here's the wonderful news. This was once a developing country. This is how it was, maybe. This was probably after Abraham Lincoln. But he said after the Civil War, we're going to start agricultural colleges. And they called it A&M. Texas A&M, Colorado A&M, agriculture, mechanics. And that still has to be a part of your structures at home, to wherever, wherever people go. And while I'm a past president of the University of Wisconsin Alumni Association, but I say, hey, don't forget the ag school. We're just a couple thousand people out there, and the school's 50,000 or more. But agriculture is important, and so many people, very few people in government know agriculture. But if we will know agriculture and we will help in development, what happened then, we were 70% of the population in the 1900 in agriculture. Today it's down, down to two to three, so they, other things can be done. Is it because other people in these other countries are lazy? Absolutely not. I've seen people toil, and whether it's Korea or wherever it is, and do the best with what they had. And they know electricity energy problem right here because they so Applied their own, but boy, how those people work. Or build a dike to keep the Ganges out so we could protect the field on the right and raise food uh, uh, for, for those villages. Or better storage. This was one village's idea of how to store the wheat in a southeastern country. Well, the rats uh, and rodents got more of the wheat than was saved for the people. And in this case, uh, building a structure to protect them from disease and other animals, this is all needed so that they could take care of it. <laughs> Kids were having trouble with blindness in this village. And uh, when our people got there, we found that it seemed that the animals looked quite healthy, better than the kids. Kids were getting blindness. And that's the case where the main food was white radishes. Well, they ate the white radishes and gave the greens to the rabbits and the other animals, but the white radishes had no vitamin A or no carotene in it. So that's one reason in the world we're trying to introduce more yellow rice in, instead of plain rice. So in this case, these wonderful women learned to feed some greens and there's this uh, hole that you see right here. And what a brave, wonderful man he, And what he wouldn't do with his life 
for his kids to be sitting here with, with you. Those people become very proud. Go to a county fair someplace and see what little people uh, could do today. This, this is in Peru, and she could be very proud of potatoes. And gardens, there's no reason why people can't uh, have gardens. Uh, a Peace Corps worker working with this particular gentleman, uh, pride, you not only fill your belly, but you fill your mind and your ambition. Um, good people. In this case, he took his little excess production to the market, and in this case, there was enough extra money from the market so that they could buy an old sewing machine. Hence, the beginning of enterprise, the beginning of a business, uh, a home business, and happiness. Um, now, back to the Americans here for a bit. Remind you that England kind of led the world in commerce before World War I. I don't know if this is in your history books or not, it should be. And then uh, the United States is a big factor, and I'm not sure who leads now. We're one of the strong partners, but thankfully we have uh, Japan, we have, we have Germany, and more countries that are seeing that capitalism works. A um, lot of things aren't made in this country anymore, and that's not all bad. Uh, because these other people need a living too. But we have to learn to be efficient and have to hold our costs down too. We're losing our automotive industry because in some cases poor management and other cases unreasonable demands by the United Auto Workers uh, Union. And on your shoes, uh, nearly 90% of all the shoes uh, worn in the US are, are made outside. Um, so, we have the knowledge, I'm gonna come to the end of these slides in a couple minutes. We have the communication technology, and all those things are available to solve these terrible problems that seem to be there today. R Rotary has led an effort to help reduce, cut polio. And so what are the real problems? Well, I say, the disintegration of the family unit. Secondly, that our education system needs tweaking, it needs changing, so that we learn about agriculture and ethics and values. Those bad guys, few in New York, who took those excessive salaries and so on, that's wrong. Ethics, uh, ethics should teach uh, against that kind of action. And a young man that I'm known, he won't work because he only wants a $25 a, a, an hour job. Well, there's nothing wrong with a $10 an hour job if it helps you make a living and it, if you're making a contribution. So our education needs to teach how to do as well as what to do. Um, economic literacy. And by that I mean understanding how this system works, and then we need leadership that comes back to guys, uh, you wonderful young people. Uh, education. Japan does a better job of high school than we do. And school days, you may or may not like this, but we're pretty short as far as school days. Pretty short, and we need to do a better job with our schools. The growing population is, is a real challenge and maybe it's the biggest one we have and that's why you're focusing on hunger here. Oh, what do we do in the free countries? That is to, to survive, we need to educate for our needs, become more international like this is right here. I can't get any more international. We need to look at, to the developing world and accept individual responsibility. Those people that came here on the Mayflower and so on, they were hungry, they wanted to do it. They accepted individual responsibility. Now we can lay back and say, well, let the government take care of it. Uh, or if they tax me too much, why should I work? Why should my son work as, as hard as he, 
is doing. Why should anybody work as hard if the taxes get too high, if others are just sit, sitting on the sideline? Um, we need to spread math and science, and there are countries that do better than we do in that regard. I was particularly lucky to have minorities to work with through the years, any place I went in the world, and this is one of my favorite teachers at Milwaukee School of Engineering. Uh, boy, did he build a lot of good young people into success. Uh, we need to watch our governments, whether you're in, from Nigeria or here, so they don't spend too much for government itself, because through the years it's just right, gone right up on, on the charts. And as I say, science is important because it's really a wonderful, wonderful help for health and for peace along with food. Uh, final point, uh, you are the leaders. You are the leaders. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. And if you and I don't do it, who's going to do it? Is it going to be done by the politicians? No. Is it going to be done only by the schools or only by a few that work so hard? No. But it, all of us, individuals, are going to do it. And if we not only want to feed the hungry, but we can really bring peace in the world, uh, I don't know a better way to do it than leadership and helping people with education and, and, and teaching. The final point is worth and dignity is a purpose of life. Actually, all animal life, whether it's uh, wild animals or domesticated animals, human beings, we're driven by two forces, physiologically. Now it's my PhD in physiology speaking. We're driven to eat and to sustain our body. The second thing we're driven for is sexual reproduction or extending our, our prodigy, our, our family. So, but of all the animals, whether it's a, whatever it is, there's only one animal with a mind, and that's the human, with a mind like here, the human mind. So this makes extra purpose for your life, the responsibility uh, to, to, to serve. Okay, I want to thank all of you for just being a wonderful judge.